Right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Derek van der Mava. I work for the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And uh, today I'm going to uh, talk to you on a, a, a wonderful group of wild dogs that occur in the Waterberg. And it's just a bit of a personal journey about the trials and tribulations of this unique population. Right. Um, now, wild dogs, um, if you'd asked me a few years ago, um, I wouldn't have said they're my favorite animal. But uh, having spent uh, a lot of time with this fabulous species over the last couple of years, they've slowly clipped into my heart and uh, I can firmly say they are one of my favorite animals. Um, but they are very, very interesting. Uh, they top water predators, they uh, weed out the weak, uh, weak and the sick and they help keep prey populations healthy. Uh, every individual in the pack is geared towards protecting and nurturing pups. This is the most important aspect of wild dog social behavior. Uh, wild dogs unfortunately lead a lot of space and in South Africa we're running out of safe space. Unfortunately, uh, we try and squeeze a lot of uh, large predators on small fenced reserves and uh, wild dogs are usually outcompeted by these larger predators as they compete for the same food resources. But uh, just a little bit of history first and a little bit of background behind wild dogs before we start chatting about the Waterberg population. Unfortunately, in Africa, there's been a huge decrease in, in the range and numbers throughout Africa. Um, wild dogs are now extinct in 29 of the 39 African countries where they previously lived. Uh, and essentially in South Africa, we now have less than 200, 450 wild dogs and most of them are confined to 14 small fenced reserves in South Africa. And uh, 450 dogs is not that many if you consider that we've got over 20,000 rhinos in South Africa. And uh, to think that we've only got uh, 450 wild dogs and almost a thousand rhinos were poached last year. Um, but just to give you a little bit of importance about the Waterberg, for those of you who haven't been up to the Waterberg, it is a beautiful area in Limpopo province. I uh, really encourage you to go and visit it. Some beautiful scenery, lovely mountains up there. But the Waterberg is one of the few areas in South Africa where the historical predator guild is still uh, more or less intact, meaning that predators that historically occurred there still occur there today. Uh, even as uh, not as long as two years ago, we had some lions come in from Botswana. Uh, but essentially, the Waterberg wild dog population is the largest free roaming population outside of protected areas in South Africa. Wild dogs are South Africa's uh, most threatened carnivore and they're the, the second most uh, threatened in Africa after the Ethiopian wolf. Um, but yeah, the 23 odd resident individuals that occur in the Waterberg are of critical conservation importance. The area also acts as an important dispersal corridor for the species and there are records of wild dogs moving from, uh, from the Waterberg both into Botswana and Zimbabwe. But yeah, if we look at the Waterberg uh, region and the sightings that we've had since 1995, uh, they were quite widespread in the 1990s and was estimated that there were over 80 dogs in, in eight packs. Uh, in, in 2005 to 2015, there was quite a strong Waterberg population. However, more recently, there's only isolated groups with dwindling numbers, as you can see by the red dots on, on the map. But yeah, there have always been wild dogs in the Waterberg. Um, uh, I recently uh, went up to the northern Waterberg and, and saw this cave painting. It's one of the only cave paintings that I know of wild dogs. As you can see there on the picture on the left is their, their, their charismatic Disney ears and as well as their white tails that are always up when they're on top of a kill. So uh, yeah, just uh, some interesting uh, uh, sand rock art in the northern part of the Waterberg, and I'm so fortunate to have gone and seen it about a month ago. Um, but wild dogs, uh, just to, to let you know where they stand in terms of the law, uh, they're categorized as an endangered species, a species facing a high risk of extinction in the wild in the near future. Although they are not critically endangered, the activities of hunting, killing, or capturing tops listed species require a permit and uh, from the relevant conservation authorities where no permits have been issued such activities are deemed a crime. Yeah, one of the most difficult um, uh, things facing conservationists over the last number of years is over many generations there's been an extremely narrow-minded mindset towards predators and it has one, been one of the most difficult challenges to overcome. Methods used to exterminate predators have been passed down from generation to generation and they're often extremely cruel. 
exposures to the extreme horror of predators attempting to, to escape from gin traps by chewing off their paws, or the indiscriminate use of lethal poisons emphasize the absolute necessity for us to, uh, for us to, um, to, to seek alternative solutions. But the Waterberg in general has changed from a livestock farming area into a game ranching area. In the 1990s, it was predominantly livestock. But the, the, the increase in the price of wildlife, specifically game, has led from this area becoming more a predominantly game ranching area. Um, we, even our president has jumped on the bandwagon and he's got a number of wildlife. But essentially, um, you can get about a 5,000 rand for a, a cow in South Africa, whereas I know recently a quarter share in a buffalo was sold for 26 million rand. The increase in, in, in the price of game in the wildlife and ranching industry has also been a difficult uh, task for us as, as carnivore conservationists. You know, landowners who, who have these very expensive prized animals on their properties simply do not tolerate any predators on their farms. And uh, unfortunately, our carnivore populations in those areas have taken a bit of knock as these carnivores have been directly persecuted. I've heard some horror stories of uh, people even killing African rock pythons because they were worried they were going to kill some of their, their prized animals on their farms. But some of the prices that these animals reached were completely ridiculous. I mean, they were selling a golden wildebeest bull for 700,000 rand just a few years ago. Um, yeah, so let's get to the main threats for the wild dogs in the Waterberg. Direct persecution is definitely the biggest threat up in that area. I mean, we've got many cases where we know wild dogs have been shot by, um, by uh, landowners. Uh, the case on the left is a case in Marikele in 2010. This particular cat pack kept escaping out of Marikele National Park and uh, predating or going into a black impala camp just outside of the reserve. And unfortunately, a farmer just had enough and one day he shot a number of these individuals. Unfortunately, that pack then dispersed out of South Africa and moved into Botswana. But even as close as last year, this particular animal uh, called uh, Lopalala, she was collared on uh, a reserve called Lopalala in, in the northern Waterberg. She was shot by a landowner last year. Uh, unfortunately, the landowner uh, thought that she was a domestic dog. Well, that's what, how the story goes. And unfortunately, she was shot. Then snaring. Snaring is also a, a major threat to wild dogs in the Waterberg. We've lost a number of animals to them. Um, that photo on the right there was a case earlier this year, in March this year. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, wild dogs are quite susceptible to snaring because when they hunt, they fan out. And uh, unfortunately, if they go through a, snaring line, a snare line, more than one or two or three individuals can often be caught uh, in one incident. Then traffic accidents, um, we know that, well, I know of many incidents, particularly in the Waterberg and Limpopo of uh, landowners and people deliberately driving over wild dogs. Uh, I know of 14 cases just in the last year, or 14 individuals that were killed. This case on the right-hand side, these two photos here, that was a particular case in 2014 on the Beauty Road uh, in, in the Waterberg. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, this is deliberate because the distance between the animals that were deliberately killed was about 200 meters. And also we found tracks going up and down, up and down over these poor animals. This individual on the left-hand side next to my bucky was probably one of the biggest male wild dogs I've ever seen. And unfortunately, he's no longer with us today. I'm just going to go through some events over the last uh, eight years that have occur occurred, uh, just some highlights and uh, tell you a little bit more about them. This particular case on the 4th of July in 2013, we had uh, three wild dogs that were in a, uh, were caught, uh, well, actually on a farm quite close to Atherston in Limpopo. The farmer was intolerant towards wild dogs and he told us that unless we come fetch them, he's gonna shoot them. So we went there, we were fortunate to dart them all and we moved them to Marikele National Park. That was a dispersal group of males, but uh, we were dumbfounded to, to follow their movements over the next three months. We released them on Marikele National Park and uh, they made their way all the way down to Madikwe Nature Reserve in the northwest, all the way down to Mafiking and across to Costa, which is actually quite close to Gauteng, and all the way back into Botswana and then back through, all the way up to Madikwe. And this was in a three month period. Um, only, uh, there were only two reported sightings of this group of uh, three males. 
Uh, we got uh, a postcard sent to us in, uh, from a farmer, well, a, a photo actually sent us a, a photo in the post from the Costa area, and these dogs were also seen crossing the Limpopo River into, into Botswana. But I mean, it just shows you the credible links that they can go to in search of uh, other single sex dispersers to form their own packs. Um, and on the 21st of November in 2013, uh, we got called in and we were told about a, a group of wild dogs in, on Napalala. Uh, we went in, we fortunately went up with a chopper and we managed to dart one of these individuals. We put a collar on him and we tracked his movements for about three months before the collar stopped working. And uh, he was mainly utilizing the Malkrafeed area and the Waterberg went down to Antibeni where we finally lost a uh, um, um, signal on the collar. And then on the 9th of May, 2014, this is quite an interesting story. Um, we moved seven wild dogs up from KwaZulu Natal to a, a landowner in the Waterberg who has got fantastic predator boma facilities. Um, we kept these wild dogs there for a period of time because there was just no space left in South Africa amongst the other meta population reserves. And this group of seven dogs actually attracted a free roaming group of 15 wild dogs in the Waterberg. The landowner then proceeded to, to shoot an impala and pull a carcass into, into one of his predator bomas where he lured all 15 dogs in and he caught these 15 individuals and he refused to let them go. Um, unfortunately, we had to get the, the Center of Environmental Rights involved and um, eventually together with the local conservation authority lead it, we went in and confiscated these dogs. We moved the seven dogs back to KwaZulu-Natal and the 15 dogs were released back into the Waterberg. This uh, incident happened on the 11th of August 2014. Uh, actual, uh, actually, a, a local mountain biker said he, there was a very sick wild dog on the 24 Rivers Road in the Waterberg, and uh, we went out, mobilized, and had a look. And unfortunately, this dog was shot in the head with a, a low caliber rifle. We took him to Dr. Peter Caldwell, probably one of the most well known uh, carnivore uh, vets in, in the country. Uh, he fixed him up and a week later we released this dog back into the, uh, the Waterberg area. Um, unfortunately, the dog only stayed alive for about, a two, uh, for about a month. He couldn't relocate his pack and uh, unfortunately we suspect he was killed either by the boons or a leopard as we found his, his carcass on a, a cliff face that was almost impossible to get to. But yeah, between 2014 and 2017 we were quite worried about the Waterberg wild dogs. Uh, we received uh, not too many sightings during that time and what was very worrying was the, the number of dogs seen in each sighting was, uh, very, was very low. So we went on a massive uh, poster campaign where we painted the Waterberg with these African wild dog posters to encourage landowners to send through their sightings. Uh, we did receive a number of sightings that you can actually still find some of these posters in the Waterberg. We also did a carnival uh, photo contest and uh, fortunately we did get some photos. But uh, we were very worried about the, water, the Waterberg wild dog population. Finally, on the 29th of May in 2017, we um, had a report of three wild dogs in, a, in another black impala camp in the, the Tabazimbi area. And uh, uh, we went out and we darted these dogs. And uh, it was quite an interesting story because um, uh, I had to then, uh, these three wild dogs were put into a, a game capture pay well a, a transport unit and we had to get them into the wild dog transport boxes uh, they were still unfortunately the vet had already left he had a prior engagement and they were all waking up but then i actually realized that these animals aren't the savage uh, creatures that many people make them out to be and i actually picked them up and put them into the boxes the middle photos of me a, a photo of me taking one of these dogs outside of the box and you can see it's completely terrified with his ears back and they're not the savage creatures that many people make them out to be. They're actually very afraid of humans. Uh, unfortunately, these three dogs, well fortunately they moved down to Antibeni where they spent some time and then they moved into the Starkrafi area of the Waterberg. Unfortunately, the last sighting we got of them was just two wild dogs, both with snares on, unfortunately, so we could presume they died. Um, but yeah, the Waterberg wild dogs were in crisis and we estimated there were just five dogs alive in the Waterberg in 2017. And uh, as you can see uh, from our sightings that the number of individuals seen per sighting really decreased from 2013 to 2017. And we knew we had to do something different. 
Um, I was obviously very concerned because I was looking after the Waterberg at the time, and I was very well worried that wild dogs were going to become extinct in the Waterberg under my, my watch. So it was time for a necessity for us to seek alternative solutions. Fortu fortunately, in the beginning of 2018, uh, 12 wild dogs were seen on a, a reserve called Lindani in the Malkrafir area. And we knew we had to follow this pack and start monitoring them very, very closely. Um, the EWT source funds to put two collars on the pack. Um, you know, collaring wild dogs is very, very important. It gives us updated GP loca GPS locations. You can have these locations every 10 minutes if you want. However, that will uh, diminish the battery life. But it also helps us to determine their home range and determine if and where they are denning. It also serves as an early warning system for landowners. If they're going to a certain property that are not wild dog tolerant, we can intervene. We can either chase the dogs off that property or we can prevent them to, from going to that property. Uh, collars also allow tourism potentials as we're able to track the dogs and know where they are. Um, there are many ecotourism lodges in the Waterberg and they love showing their guests these wonderful Waterberg wild dogs. But finally, on the 10th of April in 2018, an opportunity presented itself and there was a, a vet doing some game capture on a farm where the wild dogs were sighted and he got up into the air and we got our first uh, collars uh, on the Waterberg wild dogs in 2018. Uh, at the time, we didn't know it, but uh, fortunately, one of the dogs we collared was an alpha male. I'll tell you a little bit more as, as stories about him later on. And the other dog we collared was a young male. But uh, unfortunately, the dog on the bottom right, his name is Witwater, the alpha male. When the helicopter was up in the air, it was, uh, uh, was running out of fuel, so they actually darted him twice. And actually, he actually remained on the property where he was darted for about three or four days, still very uh, groggy from the drugs that we used and his pack moved off to about 30 kilometers north of of that farm however four days later on the 15th of april i finally went out and i tracked these dogs and I, it was a magical time actually because i got to spend about an hour with these dogs where you know in in five years of previously working with these animals i'd only caught glimpses of tails or a flicker of an ear and i spent an hour with these dogs and they were quite relaxed actually but probably most interesting was, was that Bitwater had somehow that night managed to find the rest of his pack, which were 30 kilometers away from him. It just shows you the incredible capacity of these dogs to find the, the other wild dogs in, in certain areas. And we noticed that he was mate guarding the alpha female, which we knew we were going to expect pups in the near future. We, uh, we learned a lot uh, from the collar data from this Malkrafi pack. I mean, they were utilizing a huge area in the Waterberg. They were traversing nearly 80 properties, covering uh, nearly 90,000 hectares. Um, the Endangered Wildlife Trust sourced, sourced a further two more collars. And um, unfortunately, we did have some, some collar failures. But unfortunately, there's still some very negative farmers towards wild dogs in the Waterberg. And uh, while it was difficult um, and, and monitoring them, uh, I received many personal threats, lawyers' letters, uh, farmers wanted to sue me, and it's quite ironic that the, that I was actually the only person assisting them with this. And in the Waterberg, the Endangered Wildlife Trust has placed over 63 livestock guardian dogs to reduce carnival conflicts since 19, 2008. And uh, we've had huge successes re reducing livestock losses by more than 95% on some of these farms. We also did a survey and we actually started communicating with the farmers. We had a Waterberg WhatsApp uh, group with nearly 200 landowners and concerned stakeholders. Uh, and we sent out twice daily locations to these farmers. Um, and we started to change some of these farmers' attitudes because uh, the wild dogs were only visiting their properties two or three times a year. And we generally only stay for two to three days. We did a survey that year and we uh, tested uh, the the landowner attitudes towards wild dogs and you know 65 percent of the landowners in the area were, were, were wild dog friendly and we're very happy to have the dogs 25 percent were tolerant and 10 percent were, were in completely intolerant from the collar uh, data that we've got we also learned that uh, these this particularly portion of wild dogs or population of wild dogs in the Waterberg have some unique behaviors. They always seem to rest up during the day high up in the copies and come down in the late afternoon and early mornings to hunt. And this is unlike any wild dogs in South Africa. So we did learn some interesting behavior. 
However, you know, some farmers were still not tolerant towards the wild dogs, and we did have various mitigation methods um, that we did use. We trialed uh, lion's cat bio-boundaries, which worked very, very well. Um, we also, there's a device called the Skarpwachter. Now, if you have a, um, a camp where you've got uh, high-value game species in, you can just put up one of these devices and they've got a predator repellent smell, as well as a high frequency that this device admits, which apparently uh, uh, keeps away large predators. And also when it detects there's movement in the area, some bright lights come on. So that device works very well for, 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 for camps. Also, predator-proof fencing uh, is particularly useful, particularly when you have a high-value spe game species, you can definitely keep these wild dogs out. And then also physically ch chasing them and chasing them off intolerant farms. I can't tell you how many times I, I chased these dogs off, off various properties in 2018. But yeah, just some data on the uh, lion's cat. This is uh, the, the, on the two photos on the right. Um, uh, the red line is the boundary between two farms. The farm on the left was completely uh, intolerant towards wild dogs, and this was actually during denning season. Um, and uh, um, the wild dogs were moving more and more in into this intolerant farm, and we had to do something about it. So we actually uh, went and fetched a whole lot of bags of lion scat and uh, dropped them along the fence. And uh, actually, from the data on the right, you can see that's the from the data on the, the left map, you can see that these dogs were crossing the boundary regularly. But then we put the line sketch uh, down, and the data on the right shows that it completely kept the wild dogs on, to, on the one farm. So it can be very, very, very successful. But essentially, the 2018 denning season was a major success. We obviously had to get landowner buy-in. We let the farmer know that the dogs were denning on his property. And the effect uh, of wild dogs, particularly in denning season, it can be quite uh, large on a, on a small uh, game farm. Uh, they do stick on one area for a period of two and a half months, and they can eat a lot of game on that farm. Uh, so essentially, we started calling the animals up. The whole Waterberg community came together and uh, donated a whole lot of carcasses, which we then fed to the wild dogs. Uh, this obviously uh, allowed them to, uh, to uh, well, they lessen the effect of, of the wild dogs on the, the natural occurring game on the farm. And essentially, we took in 177 guests and generated nearly 120,000 rand for these landowners during a, a one and a half month period. Uh, we essentially contained the, the wild dogs to just three properties throughout the denning season. And at the conclusion of the denning season, we donated 90 of head of game to these three farms. But yeah, the 2018 denning season was rather chaotic. Uh, we arranged tourists, we took bookings, we gave directions to get to the property, we collected carcasses, and we did all the call-ups. Call um, uh, there was no electricity on the property with very little cell phone signal. And I pretty much survived uh, for two and a half months living out of a cooler box. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was an incredible time. I got to see these wild dogs denning. I got to see them on a daily basis. I got to know their personalities. And it was just an incredible time for me in the field with these dogs. We also learned something interesting. Never before had we, had we had a report of wild dogs feeding on eland. And it was the first confirmed eland carcass that wild dogs had taken down. It was a heavily pregnant female, but nonetheless, it was interesting. But yeah, it was challenging. I had a wife at home with uh, twins that were less than a year old. Um, and I pretty much spent two and a half months in the bush trying to give this pack the best shot of survival and raising their pups. But yeah, um, it was a success. Uh, they successfully raised nine pups. And uh, we basically show that wild dogs do have the potential of making money, giving them a financial value. Yeah, it was during this time as well that we learned of two other dogs in the Freyman Rist area, just uh, east of uh, just uh, east of Fallwater. This was just two adults. Um, they were very, very skittish, and we actually tried to to collar them. Uh, unfortunately, it took us eight months to eventually collar this group, but they successfully denned and had six pups in 2018. Five of them survived and it became a pack of seven. And then in 2019, they also had a litter of eight pucks and the pack became 15 strong. But yeah, uh, it was quite uh, different. The, the Freyman's wrist pack was using a, utilizing a much smaller uh, home range than the Malcrofeed pack. They were only utilizing about 25,000 hectares, 28,000 hectares and over 25 properties. 
uh, the EWT sourced uh, three satellite collars, which allowed us to track these and monitor these dogs quite intensively. We also had a Waterberg uh, a world, uh, WhatsApp group in the Freymonstrous area, where we, edu where we sent out daily locations to all the concerned landowners. But yeah, unfortunately, the area that these dogs uh, uh, were, were, were moving in became too small for the size of the pack. And uh, these dogs were, were moving further and further away from the core range where they were safe and they started predating on cattle. And they actually predated on 35 cattle from November last year till uh, uh, March uh, this year. And there was lots of wild dog landover conflict. And we knew if we didn't do something that these dogs were going to be shot. Um, eventually a decision was made by the Wild Dog Advisory Group and LIDET, which is the Limpopo Conservation Authority, to relocate the pack. And uh, fortunately, La Palala stepped up to the plate and we were able to to move these dogs to La Palala. But uh, um, I'm going to show you a short video clip and I hope you can hear me over it. But I'm going to basically talk over it and, and uh, talk you through this relocation, probably the highlight of my conservation career. Um, um, but uh, essentially, how do you relocate uh, a pack of wild dogs that have been shot and chased off farms? You know, we thought it might be quite easy. So at the beginning of March this year, we set out to, to go and uh, hopefully capture and relocate this pack to Lopalala. But uh, we got a, um, a carcass and we went and did a call up in the area. And these wild dogs were extremely skittish. Fortunately, we did have some collars on them. So we were able to follow their movements. But uh, we quickly, quickly learned that uh, this, uh, this area and these dogs were very, very wild and it was going to take a lot of habituating and getting them to come into call ups and feeding more uh, relaxed on these carcasses. And uh, after a week uh, trying in the area, unfortunately, the timing wasn't great because COVID arrived and then the lockdown happened and essentially we couldn't travel anymore. But we knew uh, now more than ever, it was uh, very important for us to, to relocate this pack because then uh, obviously during the lockdown, there'd be very little monitoring going on. And should this, this pack then on a property, particularly a cattle property in that area, there's absolutely no way that the landowners would tolerate that. So it became very, very important for us to move the pack. We uh, fortunately got our permits in place and we set out again in April to try and uh, uh, habituate this pack and, and move them into, uh, into a safe area. And uh, essentially uh, we went out, we laid down carcasses and it became more and more provincing. After actually, I think it was on our fourth, uh, fourth attempt, um, I called the vets in and I thought we had a very good chance of, uh, of collaring them. So uh, the vets who were out with me three weeks prior actually couldn't believe that it was the same pack and that they were so relaxed. Yeah, you can see uh, two of the individuals mating. So we actually thought that um, the, a wild dog's gestation period is about 72 days. And we thought in the two and a bit months time we'd have some puppies. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't the alpha pair and the alpha pair had already mated, but I'll get to that later. But essentially, um, uh, we set off to, to collar this, this pack and um, we uh, arrived very early one morning, went out uh, with a wildebeest carcass, which we thought would, uh, would, would keep them uh, a bit longer and allow the vets to dart a few animals. Unfortunately, they wanted nothing to do with the wildebeest carcass. So we had to go and shoot an impala on the farm. And uh, fortunately, um, the wild dogs then came in and fed on the impala. But essentially, that's the first dart going in, or actually it was the third dart. You can see two wild dogs already lying down there next to the carcass. But on the first day, we managed to dart three animals and move them across to, to, to Lopalala. Um, yeah, so very encouraged by our first day, we managed to get three dogs. The second day, we went back and did another call up and we quickly realized that the dogs were skittish again and very untrusting of us as humans. So we had to get the, a chopper back in. And fortunately, we had an amazing team of Dr. Andy Fraser and Zoe Glyphus. And uh, on the second day, we managed to get another four males. Uh, it's funny that <laughs> we just got males that day. Um, but yeah, fortunately, we got another four and we moved them across to, to Lopalala. Um, on the third day, um, we were obviously at this time, we'd already got seven dogs across from this area and, and seven out of 10, and we needed three more individuals. Uh, we then um, uh, set off the next day and 
and uh, we we started calling them up again unfortunately they didn't respond to that we got the chopper in again and uh, we started uh, trying to get them via the chopper again fortunately that evening we managed to get another two both females it's funny the last three dogs that were left were all three females just the collared individual was left we actually got a dart into the the alpha female the collared individual that evening but unfortunately the, the dart bounced out and uh, I then proceeded to uh, to dig inside one of the old dens, which she managed to crawl into to try and get her out of the the, the den, but we couldn't find her. And uh, I tell you what, that is probably one of the longest nights of my life because uh, we actually safely got nine out of the ten dogs safely to the Boma in La Palala, and uh, and we we just left the one collared individual for the next morning. But I uh, monitored her movements that evening and the landowners on the farm kept on telling us that she was calling the whole night. Obviously, I'm um, very worried where the rest of her pack had disappeared off to. And uh, it was quite interesting monitoring her movements that night. She went to all of the locations where the previous wild dogs were actually darted and moved off. So we did feel very, very sorry for her. But the next morning, uh, we got up very early and I was monitoring her movements via the satellite collar. And actually that morning, um, she started moving about three kilometers away. So very quickly, I messaged uh, the landowners in the area and asked them to start playing a who call to try and entice her in. And she responded very, very quickly. She was about two kilometers away. And by the time she, we got to the farm, which was about 10 minutes later, she was already right at the house where we were calling from. So finally, we managed to collar the last uh, female, which turned out to be the alpha female. And uh, it was just such a relief that we'd uh, finally managed to get uh, all 10 dogs into the Boma safely at La Palala. But yeah, um, it was uh, rather interesting. Um, I mean, since I've been working in the Waterberg since 20, 2012, and uh, I've always wanted one of the big reserves in the Waterberg area to, to, to welcome these naturally occurring wild dogs on them. And uh, finally, it was nice that La Palala Wilderness agreed to, to take this pack, and they've recently increased their size, and they're now 50,000 hectares. So uh, yeah, the wild dogs, actually, we've had them in the Boma since we moved in there in April, and they've subsequently had 11 pups. The pups have grown up so quickly, we actually put up a whole lot of cameras at the den and we've monitored them growing up. It's been incredible to watch and uh, I've learned so much uh, from observing them on the cameras. Um, some really interesting behavior. One thing that was quite remarkable to me was just um, just how uh, loud they were at the den. And, um, and uh, yeah, watching these pups, watching them eat their first solids, watching them take their first steps out of the den. It's been an absolute incredible privilege to, what, to witness. And uh, yeah, we're going to be shortly releasing them at the beginning of October. But yeah, subsequently, we've also managed to collar another pack. Just last week, actually, um, we got a report of an injured dog crossing the R33 between Falvart and Ellis Russ. And uh, we went up and we followed and we tried to monitor these dogs. Thanks to the landowners in the area, um, we actually have, um, we actually found out that this pack has, pack has successfully had pups. And we went up with the chopper last Friday and there's four adults in the group with seven pups, which is incredibly exciting. It's great to, to know that we've got two packs that have successfully raised pups this year. But yeah, um, essentially we know going forward that we need to collar every pack or put at least two collars on every pack going forward. Um, but yeah, very, very exciting news. I'm just going to tell you about a few of the unique individuals that I've had to work with over the few year, these last few years. This is Witwater, an incredible alpha male from the Malkra Free Pack. Very nice, beautiful white dog. But yeah, it's incredible. Um, in the beginning of he in in um, the Malkra area in 2018, and, uh, and in May in 2019, we actually got a camera trap photo of him uh, on, um, on uh, Marakele Private uh, Game Reserve, which is nearly 120 kilometers away from where he previously den the previous year. Unfortunately, his pack split up early in 2019. Uh, the alpha female was killed. We don't know what happened to her, but essentially he split off with uh, four males, a dispersal group of four males. 
and then um, uh, the females split off into another area and the remaining um, pack members with their pups stayed in the Malkrafi area. But yeah, incredibly, he eventually moved back to the northern Waterberg, which again is about 120 kilometers as the crow flies, and he's actually fathered the, 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 the pack, the Twith pack that we currently uh, collared um, last week. This is Lindani. Uh, this was the alpha female of the Malkrafid pack. Unfortunately, she's the dog that went missing in early in, in, in early 2019. But quite a unique dog. What's unique about her, she's got almost a pitch black tail, which is unusual amongst wild dogs. They usually got uh, white tips on their tails, but the incredibly beautiful dog and uh, was a wonderful mother to her pups in 2018. Lapalala was one of uh, Lindani's offspring. Uh, she was uh, actually collared on Lopalala in 2019. Unfortunately, she was shot by a landowner uh, with her and a, a four dispersal females moved into that northern uh, Waterberg area. And then Voldefuffy, he was the first individual we ever collared from the Freyman's wrist pack. Um, I just want to tell you an amazing story. Unfortunately, we lost Voldefuffy earlier this year. He was killed in a snare in the, in the Freyman's wrist area. But uh, we would never have known uh, what happened to him. And actually his collar stopped working in about beginning of March this year. And I was receiving no more pins from this collar. And uh, incredibly about three weeks later, um, I received uh, two pins that came through from his collar, which I found very strange. But what was very concerning is that they were at the same spot. So very concerned, I thought something was wrong. I thought he might have been killed. So I asked the landowner to go and look in the area where I was receiving his locations and he found him caught dead in a snare, which was very, very unfortunate. But yeah, what's the story I wanted to tell you is that the only reason why we got uh, locations from this collar is that because there was a buildup of maggots and heat on that collar, it was able to get some more energy and enough power to send through two more locations. And if it wasn't for that, build up in heat, we would have never known what happened to this dog. So just a rather interesting story. But yeah, some personal highlights for me. I got to meet Princess Charlene of Monaco in the in 2018 denning season. She came to see the Waterberg wild dogs and totally fell in love with them and uh, has become the patron of the Waterberg wild dogs. And she still supports our conservation efforts on these dogs very generously. But what a lovely down to earth lady. I enjoyed a brandy and Coke with Princess Charlene, which was absolutely amazing. And then also, I mean, I got to show my young family and my wife these dogs in 2018, and I'm hoping to take them up to show them the Lapalala pack later this month. Um, but yeah, the way forward, I mean, the Waterberg essentially needs to take ownership of these wild dogs. Um, uh, we, need to, we need to give these wild dogs a financial value so that finan uh, landowners conserve them, and we need to collar at least two individuals from every pack. We need to employ a full-time monitor, and I'm very pleased to say that recently we've established the Waterberg Wild Dog Initiative, and we've recently employed a, a half-time uh, monitor who's going to be working up for us in the, in the area. Riley Mooney, you've got a big task on your hands going forward, but uh, you know the impact that you've just made over the last month has left me very confident that these wild dogs will be in safe hands going forward. But essentially, we need to make this project work in the Waterberg so that it can be implemented elsewhere in Africa. And then uh, just in conclusion, um, from an estimated five dogs in 2017, we now have 49 known resident dogs in the Waterberg, which is absolutely fantastic. But it has been a long, hard slog. And, you know, without strong community support, this would have not have been possible. Um, I've got many people who have got to thank up in that area. But, you know, we've got a much better knowledge of the Waterberg wild dog population. Uh, we've started the Waterberg wild dog initiative, which is a community based initiative in trying to conserve these these dogs and work with landowners to come up with mitigation methods for the benefit of them and these dogs. And, you know, the Waterberg has always been home to the free roaming African wild dogs, and we'd like to keep it that way. Essentially, we want to continue uh, keeping uh, to keep the area safe haven for predators and farmers and uh, wildlife ranchers so everyone can prosper. But yeah, um, I think I've gone a little bit over my time limit. 
I hope you guys found the chat very, very interesting. Apologies uh, about the dark lighting in this area, but I'd really uh, like to thank uh, various people. I'm not going to thank you all individually, but uh, this has definitely been a collaborative effort going forward. Um, uh, essentially, if you have any questions, I'm going to answer some questions now, and then, uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll try and answer as many as I can. Um, all right, let's get to some questions. Um, how do I stay po positive, steer clear? Uh, steer clear. It's uh, obviously overwhelming. Um, yeah, I mean, some days have been very, very despondent. Uh, seeing four of your animals you're trying to conserve killed on a, on a road can be, can be very, very negative. Um, but essentially, you know, when you release um, a pack of 15 wild dogs back into the Waterberg, you have a, an amazing feeling. Um, but uh, yeah, there have been some very, very tough times. But also, I mean, I got to witness uh, three litters now being born in the w Waterberg, and I've got to see these dogs growing up, and, and that essentially keeps you going through the tough, tough times. A um, uh, question from Iris Hoffman. Uh, are there wild dogs in the Valkapun and Game Reserve? How many wild dogs in the Waterberg in 2020? Iris, um, at the moment, there's no permanent dogs in the Valkafonden. We have recently had a, a dispersal pack of three unknown individuals that moved through Valkafonden, but unfortunately, they don't have uh, uh, permanent dogs there. And in the Waterberg at the moment, in, uh, we, we now have 43 individuals, uh, 23 adults and a whole lot of pups. Um, uh, Kenneth, uh, definitely, I'll definitely share my presentation. Please email me. I did leave my email address, derekv at ewt.org.za. Uh, I'll welcome share my presentation with you. Um, and then Hazel Tiffany, one of our fantastic supporters who sponsored a collar for the dogs up in, in the Waterberg. Uh, what impact will COVID have uh, on plans for ecotourism? Definitely, um, I mean, this year we missed a big opportunity uh, of taking tourists to see these dogs uh, during COVID. Unfortunately, there was no tourism activity happening. And, you know, that's why it was so important for us to, uh, to, um, to take, to, to capture those dogs and move them to La Palala, a safe place. Because I think had we not done that, uh, we wouldn't uh, have those, those dogs wouldn't be alive today. Um, all right, let's have a look here. Um, yeah, we have Fern van der Poel, who says, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I lost the question. Just hang on. Unfortunately, I can't see your whole question, Fern, um, but you're a total Lindani addict. Um, yes, the wild dogs were on Lindani recently. Lindanis have been, uh, have been wonderful to me in the Waterberg, and the wild dogs have actually been on Lindani quite a lot. Um, uh, they are, um, yeah, I must say, they've been a big help to the wild dog population. And we've actually released some of the dogs uh, onto Lindani, but definitely it's a beautiful reserve up in Limpopo. I really advocate going there. So please, they're big uh, supporters of wild dog conservation. So please uh, go, and say, go and stay at, at Lindani. And then uh, Penny Abbott. Uh, is the is the, this the only area in South Africa with free ranging wild dogs? Penny, uh, up to about three years ago, it was one of the only areas. But we do also have uh, a small population of free roaming dogs in northern Limpopo. We uh, we do have collars on one pack that go in between uh, uh, Botswana and South Africa in the all days area, and then there also are two small packs or one large pack and a a small pack in the Messina area in northern Limpopo. But other than that, um, the, also the western boundary, there are obviously of Kruger, there are a number of free roaming wild dogs in that area, but they do occur mostly on safe reserves. Um, and then from Louise, uh, Derek, we're going to La Palala crew in two weeks' time. You are definitely going to get the opportunity of a lifetime, Louise. Uh, we're actually collaring dogs in that. We're going to collar that entire pack going forward just to, because you know what we've noticed in the Waterberg, that is if you put a, a collar on a wild dog, you essentially save that wild dog's life. And landowners are too scared to shoot or persecute them. And they know that uh, if uh, they do kill one, we'll go, and, uh, we'll, we'll go and, and check up on it and they can get into some serious trouble. So Louise, I'm looking forward to possibly meeting you up there in two weeks time. 
uh, you're in for a wonderful opportunity. And also, uh, just to let everyone else, else know there, we are doing a coloring exercise with guests. Please go and see the Tinswalo uh, page, uh, website, and uh, Tinswalo, Lapalala, and Norka um, are offering a coloring uh, exercise for anyone interested in, in going out and seeing how we do real hands-on conservation. It's a wonderful once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So please, if you can support it, Please uh, go and come visit us then. Um, Alistair Stalker, uh, are there dog, no dogs in Valkhfunen and Maritaba, Marakele? No, no permanent, perm permanent dogs up there. They are only, uh, every now and again, there's small dispersal groups moving through there, but unfortunately they don't have permanent dogs. Um, all right, I'll answer three or four more questions. Um, and then uh, we'll call it a night. Uh, if if uh, I don't get to your question, please, you're welcome to email me. Uh, I'll, I'll gladly uh, get to um, get to your your questions later. Um, Barbara Russell, um, you, do you want an update on the mails that went from Tembi to Kalarari? Uh, I would suggest you contact Cole Duplessis. He'll be able to answer that for you. Um, Eleanor Cadell, are there um, any other initiatives elsewhere in Africa and if so, can they learn from your experience? Definitely Eleanor, I'm actually liaising at the moment with uh, some people in, in, in Namibia who are struggling with many of the things I struggled with and you know it's not about reinventing the wheel, it's about learning from each other and we definitely are trying to assist them and, and trying to get a similar initiative running up in that area. Nicole Burry, uh, as private property owners in the Waterberg, how can we get involved um, to ensure the future of these amazing dogs? Nicole, please get hold of me. Um, really, we're looking for some volunteers up in that area. I can put you in, in contact with Riley Mooney. Um, and uh, we'll definitely, we need some volunteers up there. Also, uh, obviously, we always need funds to put uh, uh, collars on these dogs. So any financial contribution will be, will be much appreciated. Uh, Jobe Hofmeyer, um, the females must be incredible mothers for their pack to have increased so abundantly. Uh, and thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. Thanks for your kind words, Jobe. Um, Yes, no, it's incredible. You know, these uh, females, I know the, the most pups of females ever successfully raised is 22, but they are absolutely incredible um, uh, mothers. And, uh, you know, go log on to the, uh, the Lapalala Wild Dog um, uh, cams. They live update, live feeds of the dogs in those areas. And there's some fantastic, go on to YouTube, there's some fantastic footage of these dogs growing up. Um, Victoria Petley, is it possible to visit and see the Waterberg dogs? Yes, shortly we'll be releasing these dogs onto Lapalala and I'm sure we can arrange uh, visits into the area to see the wild dogs. So please contact me privately. Uh, Len LaRue, um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I have been assisting your daughter in the Mabea. She's uh, coming to a lot of the stumbling blocks that I came into in the beginning. And Nadia, you must just uh, keep fighting the fight You'll get there eventually in the end, but uh, a big uh, thing, uh, some advice to you is you definitely need to get collars on the dogs up there. Um, and then Judy Mervis, last question, guys. Uh, thanks so much for your hard work. Uh, what plans, if any, are there for wild dog tourism? Well, definitely, we're working with a lot of ecotourism uh, people up in the Waterberg. Um, we are, when the dogs are on their properties, we do let them know. Um, but uh, definitely going forward, particularly in denning season, we're going to be doing similar initiatives that we did to 2018, and we're going to take uh, tourists in to see these wild dogs when they are denning by generating uh, funds for the local landowners. They won't persecute them any further. So please, uh, every, anyone, if you want some more information, go and look at the Waterberg Wild Dog Facebook page. I really hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, apologies, I had to do it in the dark as we do have load shedding but I hope you, you, you really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks a lot for joining and, and asking about uh, the incredible wild dogs of the Waterberg. Good night to you all.